Okay. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. Welcome and thank you, Sembis people, for joining us the 98th seminar, and I call it a uh, University of Manchester Day. I'm also looking forward to having a uh, moon festival. That's not celebrating me. Uh, this is celebrating the full moon, I guess, or harvest in Asia. I attended the SOSB Climate Tech Summit this week, meeting many climate tech founders, researchers, and investors. The climate crisis is an urgent problem to solve right now, but it can be solved only by collaboration, I believe. I also hope young and senior researchers will contribute to solving this issue together through synthetic biology and other technologies. Lastly, I hope Nobel Prizes will be awarded to another synthetic biologist next week. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Patrick Kai. He is a professor at University of Manchester, UK, and a chair in synthetic genomics. Notably, he is an associate editor of ACS Synthetic Biology, asking me to review too many articles, I believe. And I think the last time we met was when I visited University of Manchester that's last year to give a seminar. At that time, it was too short because of my other seminars in UK and other parts of the world. I'm very glad to see him again, although this meeting is virtual. Patrick, thanks so much for your contribution to the scientific society, including your service as an editor of the flagship journal of synthetic biology, and the virtual podium is all yours. And now, thank you so much. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. Um, okay, I just going to. Wonderful. Can you see my slides? I only yes. got one slide, and I will stick to time. And let's see where I can move up the. Hold on. So I guess you know, and um, thank you very much for having me on this fantastic you know series of webinars. Um, I think you know. I really like to just spend these five minutes to chat about what I've been through in the last you know, 20 years. Um, and we just recently celebrated the 10 year anniversary of my group. So that gave me a really good opportunity to look back and through my training and education and a bit of my career to really reflect you know, my journey up to this point. And I thought that might be you know, really good to share this you know, experience in these five minutes. Um, and, and hopefully that's useful for some of the audience. So I was actually trained as an engineer in computer science. So I did my undergraduate in computer engineer in China. Um, I, when I graduated, I only want to do two things. One is robotics, the other one is linguistics. Like, so I'm only interested in automation and languages. Then when I finished my degree and I said, okay, I look up the map, I said, well, I can study these two. And the top place is either MIT or Edinburgh. Um, and, you know, it was after 9-11, so it's virtually impossible for me to go to America. So I decided to go to Edinburgh in 2005. And then I was enrolled in a program called Bioinformatics. And that was the first challenge in my life. It's really, I don't understand what they're talking about because you know, part of my training is in mathematics, but, you know, I start engaging with people who start speaking in ATCGs and, and that gap in communication was very challenging. And not to say they speak Scottish English in that part of the world. So I was virtually struggling in the first, you know, six months of my master. Then the turning point is I start meeting with a group of people in Edinburgh who interest 
in programming bacteria instead of programming a robot. Um, and just like, you know, they think they can program the behavior of the bacteria. So I was enrolled in the, you know, international competition um, for synthetic biology at the time, iGen. And we are the first team from Scotland to compete. And I built the arsenic biosensor, you know, which as you, you may have heard about, is a 2006 project. We program the bacteria which can detect very low concentration of arsenic contaminant in the drinking water. And, and that really turned myself into a biologist. Um, and I guess, you know, looking back at that challenge to really break the communication barrier between an engineer and biologists to really pay off after, you know, so many years. Then I went to IGM, I meet, you know, one of the judges and he said, will you want to come to my group and study, you know, how we use language models to design synthetic DNA. And at the time I already signed up for Cambridge. I was about to go to Cambridge for, for my PhD, but I thought, oh, that was a fantastic idea because that really bring back my, my early interest in linguistic, how human language is organized in a very structural way, you know, in you know, what we call the rules or the syntactic or semantic model. And can we do the same for DNA? So I was, you know, um, I, I basically did, you know, my PhD in, in the interface of linguistics and biology, you know, sequence design. Um, so that's my PhD, I, I be a genome cat. And then when I finished my PhD, I moved on to Johns Hopkins to do my postdoc with, you know, Jack Booker, who is a pioneer in building synthetic genomes. So I said to Jeff, you know, who happened to be here a few days ago, and I said to Jeff, um, you know, about 13 years ago, I said, you know, I would go to your group and do a postdoc with you with a condition. I would not write a single line of code because I know I'm really good at writing codes, but I'm not going to write a single line of code. So I become a biologist. I become a you know yeast geneticist, uh, and you can see there's a picture of me, you know, making lots and lots of you know you know petri dishes, and 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 that's basically my three years of training in Johns Hopkins. I really turn myself into a biologist, um, and also you know in Johns Hopkins, you know, I teach a class called Biogenome. So we have you know, you know, lots of students, we teach them how to synthesize synthetic chromosomes for us. Um, and, and at that time, it seems to be a mission impossible. You know, I said, you know, you have, you know, all these undergraduate students build a chromosome for you, and that takes years, how are you going to finish the entire genome? So at that point, I start turning, you know, Jeff into this idea, we, we can internationally synthesize the East Genome and, and let it become a community effort. Um, and so I initiate and start the International Consortium for Sensitivity East Genome Project. And now we have over 10 universities from four continents to synthesize the chromosome together. And this is a community led project. And, and it's going to be a community resources without any MTA attached. So in 2013, I moved back to Edinburgh where I start my career, I become a Chancellor's Fellow. Um, as I told you, we called in, I called in the Synthetic East Genome Consortium, and we published a few papers in science in 2017, I think. Um, and then, but also I think back to my early, you know, um, interest in robotics. So I start thinking about, can we bring robotics in the molecular biology operation? Because a lot of our time is spent on moving liquids around, right? So we use peptides to move around little, uh, micro little droplets. And then I start thinking about this idea, can we use robotics, which is pervasive in manufacturing business, right? You manufacture cards with, you know, robots, not hands. Um, so I build what we call Aiden Virginia Foundry, but this is really linking back to my early interest in robotics and, and scheduling optimization. Um, and then in 2017, I moved to Manchester to start my group here. And I guess, you know, um, if I can to finish my talk um, to just give the young people a bit of unsolicited advice. Um, the first one is, you know, embrace your unique background. Um, so I was trained as an engineer. And, you know, when I first into biologist, I feel very difficult and I feel it's, 
you know, in so many occasions, I ask myself, why am I here? <laughs> um, I do not understand what they're talking about. But I think if you, you know, hold on to that, the stars are will align and eventually, you know, it will start making sense to you. So for instance, my background in robotics and linguistics certainly benefit me a lot in my career. Um, and I, I finally feel I, I have a unique corner in, the, in, in this community. And the second is, you know, skipping at the age is hard because, you know, doing interdisciplinary work is not easy, um, but it's a lot of rewarding, right? So now my group is funded by, you know, you know, biology councils, engineer councils, and, and all kinds of funding sources and streams. And it's kind of fun to have a group of very diverse background. Um, I would encourage people to be brave and, you know, keep skipping at the age. And be resilient, you know. What you know? They say when the the guard closes the door, he opens a window, right? So I say to my student, our job is to deal with failures, right? Statistics speaking, you know, we're dealing with rejections all the time. You know, the grand success rate is probably ten percent, and the chance of getting into nature science is you know probably two percent, right? So statistics speaking, we deal with failures, and all the time, and we need to be resilient. Um, and finally, you got to enjoy the journey, right? It's not about the end point. It's not about where you finished. It's really about the journey which leads you to the finish line. And I guess that's my five minutes. I just really want to share with you a bit about my experience and hope, you know, you all enjoy it. Thank you. So that that's brilliant, Patrick. No, I absolutely agree with you all point you just made. And, you know, I actually just, start to talk with the Leo before you join us. And then some of that actually I share with him and that absolutely brilliant. The last point actually to enjoy the journey. So that's the, something I recommend to every single young people because this is not, this is not the 100 meter sprint race. This is the marathon or lifelong journey, I believe. If you cannot enjoy what's the point and that's what i want to say so absolutely brilliant and amazing thank you so much thank you and i hope let's say up leo for his fantastic talk coming up thank you sure. for having me. okay thank you so much and also another thing i want to mention i use your arsenic sensor item uh example for my lecture but i didn't know you are part of the team I found well, out. I was today. part of the team because part of because only the only person who knows anything about mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's wonderful. Yeah, I use that on every single lecture I giving. So as a the one of the only example of IGM activity. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. Dr. Leo Green received his bachelor's degree in chemistry. It's another interesting, you know, transition, I guess, from Hampton University in 2011. He is a, a UNCF Mark Science Fellow, a Ronald McNair Fellow, and received the Hampton University 2011 Future Nobel Laureate Award from Hampton's School of Science, I guess just in time. He transitioned to the Department of Bioengineering at UC Riverside for his doctoral studies with an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. His doctoral thesis focused on engineered nucleic acid-based nanostructures and coupled their mechanical properties to the to a synthetic trans, transcriptional oscillator. Dr. Green completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech, where he worked on engineering population controllers in synthetic E. coli-based communities. His interest in chronic disease and inflammation led him to explore implementing biological controllers as therapeutics for host micro, uh, modulation, microbiome modulation. He is currently 
an assistant professor in the biomedical engineering at Purdue University. I believe he's a true rising star given his diverse interest in different topics and then also his kind of career project trajectories. And I wish he could receive Nobel Prize in 20 years. Leo, uh, thanks so much for your time today and please take it away, all yours now. Awesome. Thank you for the, for the nice introduction. Um, and so you can see my screen okay? Yes. Great, great. Uh, so yes, hi everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Leo Green and I am an assistant professor in biomedical engineering uh, here at Purdue University. And uh, if it's okay, I would like to share the overall direction of my research lab. We started here at Purdue in 2011, or sorry, in 2021. Um, and so I'm um, starting my third year. And so what we're trying to do is retool living organisms and rewire host immune response through the microbiome. And I should first start by telling my, uh, my middle daughter, happy birthday. Her name is Colette and she's turning three today. Um, and so it's, 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 it's an honor to, um, to be giving a talk and, uh, and, and, and celebrating her um, as well. And so that's, that's her in the front with the, with the pink glasses. So my, my lab encompasses three main research areas. Um, there's computational models, bacterial engineering, which we plan or we like to uh, engineer therapeutics or theranostics that can sense and respond to disease states, as well as molecular programming, which will allow us to build synthetic components uh, to give us the flexibility to detect um, various combinations of these biomarkers. And as, as mentioned, just wanted to quickly recap that uh, I did receive my BS in chemistry um, and there started with inorganic nanoparticle research, uh, where then I transitioned to bioengineering, um, where I was interested in learning more about building biological control systems using DNA as the material uh, and transitioned to Caltech uh, for my postdoc. Uh, where I got into microbiome engineering, engineering E. coli and E. coli nissel, which is the foundation of some of this talk. So starting with a little bit of background, chronic disease is impacting our life, uh, and this is a, a global concern. So you can see here in, in the blue region, the non-communicable non diseases or chronic diseases make up for about 70 to 80% of all deaths around the world. And if you take a deeper dive into what, what those conditions are, these are the conditions that we actually hear about quite often, the cancers and cardiovascular disease. Um, and they, they, they span um, the entire body. And so it's not just the chronic disease that is a concern, but it's the multimorbidity aspect of chronic disease meaning having multiple chronic conditions at one time. And so what my lab is really interested in is sort of exploring what is the systemic effect of the chronic immune response and how does that lead to chronic conditions in different organs? And so the approach, the general concept that we think about is first we consider the different types of tissues that make up the organs throughout the body. And we realize that although the structure might be different across the different organs, generically or generally they have similar immune response and that response is conserved across the body. And something else that's conserved is much of these um, tissue types actually have a residing microbiome that is associated with the organ. And so this gives us an opportunity from the engineering side of things to be able to uh, identify microorganisms that are commensal or reside natively uh, in the tissue or on the tissue of these organs and use those as potential hosts to engineer um, smart therapeutics, therapeutics that can sense and respond to the environment. And so the overall objective of the lab is to design 
commensal microbes that can sense, in this case, a host-produced biomarker. So shown here in blue is, is an, inflam an inflammation biomarker that's secreted or produced by the host cells, as well as some external input is what we're striving for now, but this might be a secondary input associated with chronic disease. And these two biomarkers being processed in order to drive the production of a therapeutic output. And so there is this regulatory response where the bacteria, the commensal strain can sense and respond to a combination of biomarkers. And when that combination of biomarkers is present, it'll produce the proper therapeutic. And so in order to do that, we have three different approaches. And I'll start with a, a computational model, which allows us to build um, a systems biology networks and, and start to understand what kind of control mechanisms we, we might need to engineer into the bacteria. So thinking about the acute inflammatory response, we understand that it's a very complex system, um, coordinating multiple cell types, immune cells and resident tissue cells, um, as well as different types of immune signals. So these can be metabolites, um, host-produced or microbial-produced metabolites, as well as cytokines. And this complex network results in a sequential um, healing dynamic that will eventually prevent pathogens from further invading the tissue and, and, and causing what would be considered systemic chronic condition. Um, and so the condition that we're interested in is sepsis, and this is the idea that microbes are able to invade the body um, and cause an immune response that results in what's known as hyper and hypo inflammation. And this is work done with a collaborator, um, Professor Xuan Tang uh, at Louisiana State and a graduate student, Derek, Derek Donkwa. And so what we're trying to do is build a systems model to predict what we would consider a healthy immune response where the immune cells here just shown as arbitrary purple, red, and green traces. Their abundance or the dynamics of their abundance follows the sequential acute wound healing dynamics. However, in a sepsis environment, what you might see is that the immune cells um, associated with the response actually get stuck in a hypo and a hyper inflammatory response. So considering the purple trace as a pro, the purple and red traces as pro-inflammatory immune cells, such as macrophages M, M1 cell type, and the green trace representing the anti-inflammatory macrophage cell type M2 macrophage, what you notice is that both the M1 and the M2 cell types are above a threshold for an extended period of, of time. And this is actually contradictory, con, con, contradicting to the immune response because the pro-inflammatory response is high as well as the anti-inflammatory response is, is, is high. And this is what leads to the occurrence of, of, of sepsis, um, which is an impaired or paralyzed immune response. And so our approach is we take a detailed systems or we build a detailed systems network where we think about the primary innate immune cell types that are involved in the immune response, neutrophils, monocytes, pro-inflammatory M1, anti-inflammatory M2, fibroblasts, and myofibroblasts to represent the closing or the healing of the um, chronic environment. And so with this, with this model, we're able to demonstrate our ability uh, to, to dynamically simulate the immune signaling dynamics involved in an acute wound healing system where each cell type sy systematically pulses in terms of cell abundance or cell counts as the healing progresses. Compared to the septic healing environment, where we notice we have this oscillatory dynamic with the neutrophils, um, as well as an overabundance of 
the M1 and M2 macrophage cell types representing pro-inflammatory and, or sorry, the, the M0 and M1 macrophages representing pro-inflammatory cell types and the M2 macrophages. And so we're able to build this model and demonstrate a healthy immune healing system as well as a broken state. And what we're interested in doing is thinking about what kind of control mechanism might we need to engineer to detect the onset of sepsis and produce an output that can regulate it. And so here we demonstrate what might be a simple threshold model that will allow us to detect a specific biomarker from the innate immune response set a threshold so that when the biomarker is above that threshold, we activate the expression of our output, which would be used to reset the immune system. And so using our model, we are able to demonstrate here the uncontrolled dynamics that was described in the septic wound healing system, where you have high abundance of M1 and M2 concurrently, uh, in the chronic system. However, in our regulated system where we have a controller that's able to sense the presence of overabundance of M2 and, and reset the immune dynamics, we're able to force the pro-inflammatory macrophage cell count or abundance back down so that we get the proper sequential wound healing dynamics that we would expect. First, neutrophils, then M1, then M2, followed by fibroblasts, ending with myofibroblasts as the healed and, and healthy state. So using the information from the systems biology model, what we hope to do is build a bacterial system that can, um, that can demonstrate that sophistication of sensing and responding to environmental conditions. So in able to do that, in, in order to do that, we have to build a library of immune associated components. And so that includes your sensors, the ability to detect the associated biomarkers with sepsis in the case as described before. Therapeutic outputs, these might be anti-inflammatory cytokines or metabolites that are known to, to reduce um, chronic, chronic environments. Information processing, this is the ability to sense multiple inputs and do some information processing about the abundance, how much of those inputs are present in order to drive the output. Identifying the microbial chassis, so which chassis is best for the, for the disease state or the organ of, of interest. And future work will include optimizing our circuits and the organ on a chip system and eventually characterizing the theranostic effects in an in vivo model. So in, in this work, we use 3G assembly, Golden Gate Gibson, which allows us to um, connect multiple components, the promoter, which in our case is one major um, aspect of sensing, the RBS, which is the ribosome binding site. This is a way we can tune the expression of the downstream gene. The gene that is whatever we want to express, for example, the anti-inflammatory marker, terminator and origin of replication, um, which is another mechanism of tuning expression. And so using 3G assembly, we can piece together any combination of these components and form multiple tran tran transcriptional units that we can then transform into the bacterium um, and this is a single day protocol. And so what we're describing is the combination of developing a logic inflammation sensor that can detect a well-characterized pro-inflammation um, biomarker tetrathionate using a two component histidine kinase system. Coupling the tetrathionate input as well as a secondary input to drive the logic expression of a GFP output and optimizing this logic gate system. And then finally, repressing, re replacing the GFP expression with the expression of an anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-22 that can be secreted. And so this is work that I started as a postdoc with the wonderful help of Liana Merck, um, who is now a PhD student 
at Harvard, um, we first had to characterize the in, or, or optimize the sensitivity and the um, the expression range of the two component tetrathionate system. And so what we did was we screened the library of ribosome binding sites upstream of the TTRS and the TTRR, the two components required for detecting tetrathionate inside of the bacterium. And so since we're expressing these, this is a recombinant expression from a different organism, we have to identify what strengths of expression do we need for each of these, and then also analyze what is the dynamic range of the sensitivity of the output of this um, tetrathionate detection system. And so what we're looking at in the bottom traces are GFP normalized by OD over a period of 24 hours. And each of these plots are different combinations of ribosome sequences, RBSS and RBSR. So we're able to demonstrate that we can fine tune the sensitivity of our system based on the expression of each of the components. Let's see. Furthermore, um, we took the optimized inflammation sensor and coupled it to a, 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 a split activator and logic gate, um, where one input, in this case, IPTG, which is a chemical inducer, expresses the first component, HRPS, of the split activator, and the tetrathionate system that we optimized previously expresses HRPR. And when these two are expressed together, they are as as an AND function to turn on um, the expression of GFP. And so what we demonstrate with, with this system is the ability to um, engineer a logic AND gate system that can detect an environmental inflammation biomarker tetrathionate, as well as a manual controller IPTG with the logical function. And so as we increase the amount of tetrathionate going down this heat map from zero to one millimeter, or one micromolar, sorry, and increase the amount of IPTG from zero to one micromolar of concentration, only when both inputs are present, we have the logic gate func functioning um, as an expression of maximum GFP. So finally, we wanted to couple the sensing, the logical sensing of tetrathionate and, and IPTG now replaced with ATC to minimize leak. Um, we want to switch the GFP expression with a pro with an anti-inflammatory cytokine IO-22. And in order to do that, as well as secrete it, we functionalized IO-22 with, with a HIL-A tag, as well as expressing the HIL-A, HIL, -A, HIL HIO B, HIO D components in the E. coli organism. This is actually in E. coli nissel, a probiotic strain. And we demonstrate the ability to secrete IO-22. Um, so this is uh, in collaboration with the postdoc in my lab, as well as a graduate student in, in a collaborator's lab. Um, and so we're able to demonstrate that the logic gate, only when both inducers are present, we can have secretion of IO-22, and we can characterize this over time um, using a, uh, a Luminex cytokine ass assay, uh, where after six hours, when both inducers are present, both ATC and tetrathionate are present, we have the secretion of IO-22. One thing to note is that it, as we allow our system or our, our bacteria to continue to incubate between 12 and 24 hours, that we notice that the circuit breaks. And so we're, we're starting to analyze why this is. We suspect it's because we optimize our system to produce um, or to, per, to respond logically during the growth phase of the bacteria. Um, and so we're now reconsidering how we would optimize this system for stationary phase if, if, if necessary. And so finally, I just want to briefly introduce um, the molecular programming or the application of DNA nanotechnology in, in our lab. 
And this is really new work um, where I'm picking back up on my PhD training where we're engineering DNA nanopores and we're embedding them into live cell membranes. And so the, the, this nanopore is a previously characterized nanopore that has a pore size of 0.8 nanometers wide. And so with a collaborator here at Purdue, the giant lab, we thought that it would be fascinating to try to embed these DNA nanopores into live neuron membranes using this nanopipette. And so what we do is we um, load the pipette tip with pre-assembled nanopores that are labeled with Psi-3 dye. And we get the pipette tip really close to the membrane of the neuron such that a small amount of the neuronal membrane enters the pipette and allows for the, for the incubating nanopores to embed isothermally into the membrane. And what we're able to show here is that we can measure, oops, we can measure the current, um, or we, we can see a change in current um, with our pores and, and that there is a significant difference in reading without the nanopores. So one minute upon touching the membrane with the, with the nanopipette, we see that the reading, that the current is pretty low. Um, but after 20 minutes of incubation, you can see that we can start to get um, some reading from these nanopores. And so there's a lot of work that we do have planned with the embedding of these nanopores into different types of cell membranes, um, spanning from eukaryotic and prokaryotic systems. And so hopefully there will be more to come from that. I uh, just want to give a special thanks to all of my lab members in my growing lab, as well as my collaborators and the funding opportunities. Uh, that allowed for this work. And I'm happy to accept any questions. Thank you. Absolutely amazing talk. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a little bit shorter, I guess, but I will start a question uh, for your uh, end gate work with the mm -hmm. uh, probiotic, because that's also one of my interests. So mm -hmm. that uh, end gate basically you know, each layer, uh, there, there are actually one layer, you know, in the sensing part, and then another layer in the processing and the, you know, the reporting part, it, mm -hmm. it takes time. Uh, and then you probably also want to have, you know, quick response because, I mean, not necessarily the probiotics stay long enough in the mm -hmm. gut. So can you kind of comment on that, you know, that kind of short response requirement at the same time, you know, the, you know, resident time is not that much longer uh, than we want to see. And right. that's the one, my first, first question about this system. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. I think, I think this is a, a very good point and it's something that we should consider. And so one aspect that I'd like to point out is that there is the probability there is the possibility of fine tuning how much secretion we can get over a period of time mm -hmm. um, by, of course, changing the RBS up, up, upstream of, of each of the components, right? And so there are multiple layers. And so we've only optimized it for the most part. Um, well, I guess that's not true, but you know, we've in in this case, we're only demonstrating the optimization at the expression of the two component sensing, but mm -hmm. you can imagine that if we, that it could be possible to, if we replace this with IO-22 so that we can secrete it, we can also fine tune the expression strength here and potentially get a varied output based on the input concentration. Uh -huh. And so ideally what you would like is a very high dynamic range of that output. Mm -hmm. So that if there is a lot of signal then you can produce enough of that out of the output in a continuous mm -hmm. manner, um, but mm -hmm. it's, it 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 will it will require optimizing the maximal output to match the therapeutic effect in the gut. I see, most certainly. I see. So in that case, I mean, I understand why you using you know two input and the gate because I'm big. I was big fan of the 
complex circuit before because actually I made the four input AND gate before because I believe at the time mm -hmm. the more complex the better. But now mm -hmm. I changed my mindset because real application may require this very basic simple circuit. Mm -hmm. So this one increase of course specificity because you have now two signal rather than one signal. But by simplifying the circuit architecture, just one input and one output system, you may have better response time by sacrificing specificity. Have you kind of considered that option as well? Yeah, and, and so actually, you know, it's it's funny that that you flipped from complexity to simplicity. Right. And I think that the complexity is actually going to be required, but it's going uh -huh. to require very structured um, organization. And so uh -huh. what I mean by that is, yeah, a four input logic gate is probably necessary, but really? they will likely need to produce different outputs. Uh -huh. And so really the coupling would be two separate logic gates maybe. Uh -huh. One that's responding to one known pathway that's associated with a disease. Uh -huh. And the other might respond to a secondary pathway. And this is uh -huh. where the systemic response I'm interested in comes into play. Because, for example, with like gut health, we know that there is an environmental factor such as like what you consume. Uh -huh. But then there's also stress. And uh -huh. so the biomarkers related to what you're consuming and how that causes inflammation are likely different than the biomarkers that's caused by stress. Uh -huh. and so the output of those functions might also need to be different. Uh -huh. And so if, if we're going to regulate IBD or something like that, I think there's going to require this complexity of sensing multiple biomarkers for pathway A, as well as multiple biomarkers for pathway B. So that uh -huh. way we really target the um target the disease more accurately for that I see. so so your goal is kind of increase the specificity of targeting of targeting by identifying the pathways that are most prevalent to causing the condition i see so the i, I will completely understand because that's the entire my more than 10 years of you know the the you know project ideas i mean the sensing and responding to increase the specificity and that's how i and why i developed the four input end again the one caveat would be you know now i realize because we are putting in unnecessary genetic circuit into the bacteria bacteria actually do not like those circuit at all so mm -hmm. the caveat is basically, you know, metabolic burden, mutation, or, you know, instability. The, because after kind of realizing those kind of problem, my mindset become, you know, from the complex circuit is good one to complex circuit is not necessarily good. So that's right. why I'm asking that question. So in that case, could you, how how are you gonna solve the burden problem or, uh, you know, the mutational instability problem because at the end of the day, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the region we want to have inducible, you know, curing rather than constitutive expression of curing molecule is that constitutive expression is burdensome. And then, you know, that's not good for the therapeutic purpose. But if the therapeutic protein or molecule is not necessarily harmful to the, you know, patient, mm -hmm. we may have just constitutive expression of those protein. But at the same time, you know, that's burdensome to bacteria, so bacteria may not like that one. So there are very subtle, in yeah. subtle, you know, balance between this burden problem and the specificity problem. So, and right. that. Yeah, I'm constantly thinking about, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I think this is this is a good problem for control theorists, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, yeah. and so you can think about like maybe there is a basal amount of mm -hmm. signal that should be produced at all times to maintain just an overall healthy environment. Mm -hmm. But in moments that 
there's a spike, a quick change right. in that environment that could cause pathogen pro proliferation or for whatever reason, excessive um, immune response, you might need your system mm -hmm. to respond to that spike quickly mm -hmm. or maybe respond to it for a, a sustained period of time and then fall back down to its, to its basal level. And so mm -hmm. those are the kinds of circuit motifs that we're interested mm -hmm. in engineering in the controller system. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, but you also bring up a good point of like trying to figure out a way if if we do need these complex systems, mm -hmm. how do we decouple the the cell and its native machinery from the genetic circuits that right. we want to right. engineer? And I think this is where the nucleic acid nanotechnology uh -huh. will come into play because uh -huh. then you can start to take advantage of the unique hybridization of specific sequence sequences of DNA molecules to target, you know, different um, inputs, essentially, and sure. also have uh, use, you know, some sophisticated gene um, strand displacement networks and things of that nature to, mm -hmm. to release the right output. And so I think it's going to be a, a combination of recombinant engineering as well as DNA nanotechnology. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, this problem is hugely complicated. That's why I am excited. And even though that is too challenging. So yeah. thank you so much for your wonderful, you know, answer to a very challenging question. So I have one question from audience. Uh, Maya asked question that is, are there any prospects for small nanostructure, uh, in other words, the channels, being expressed in a in cell, so it can be the output of the autonomous circuit. That's interesting. Uh, if not, what are the other options for integrating DNA nanostructure into circuit behavior? Yeah, I think I think Maya is reading my mind. That's I think that is the next step. Um, okay. And 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 so um, yeah, if you're if you're interested in working on those kinds of projects, please do reach out. I would I would love to uh, to chat with. You. But I think alternative approaches would be um, so if we're talking about membrane interfacing, the ideal system would be encoding that into the organism and having it self express and self fold and things of that nature. Very very challenging thing to do. Mm -hmm. The other is if you can just assemble your nanostructures and incubate them at 37 degrees in whatever media and you know they just embed into the cell and you can take advantage of those nanopores um i think that is an alternative approach too um and then you know you can think about functioning those nanopores to detect um different different ligands and things of that nature um, I think the benefit of the second approach is that you can also add um, quencher floor for pairs so you can get direct readouts from binding and things of that nature that's difficult to do by genetically expressing them inside of the organism. So there's trade-offs there as well, but both are very interesting strategies. Thank you for the question. I, I see. That's, that's interesting. So... Let me double check whether we have another question. So I don't see anything. So let's let's close and then we continue to chat. Sure. Okay. So thank you so much again. You know, your wonderful talk. This is amazing. So thank you all for joining and staying today. And we'll meet again next week on October 5, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Nigel Scruton also from University of Manchester, UK, and Dr. Yosef Song from MIT. As usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speakers. I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and flitty faces if you wish. And thanks. Also, happy uh, Moon Festival again, or Chuseok in Korean, or whatever 
you know, Oriental Asian Thanksgiving Day uh, tomorrow. I'll stop recording. One second.